It's a crazy world out there. How do we raise boyish boys and feminine girls? I know from the response I got to part one of this two-part series last week uh, that a, a number of you are feeling the burden of this reality. How do we do this? How do we do this well? Well, here's the fundamental answer to the question. We do this well by going to scripture, by going to God's word, and by grounding all of our thinking and all of our practice in the word of God, because the word of God is the very expression of the mind of God as God has desired to reveal it. And so even though our culture is in massive chaos, as we talked about in the previous episode, part one of this two-part series, we can find clarity and coherence and order in the Word of God. In this particular episode, then I want to pick up where we left off with uh, uh, truths four, five, and six about how we raise boyish boys and feminine girls. Welcome to Grace and Truth. My name is Dr. Owen Strand. Uh, thank you for being with me in this journey. Please subscribe to this podcast and share it and review it as you are able. Uh, I am an employee of the James Dobson Family Institute. I run the Dobson Culture Center these days, and I'm very thankful for that work. Very thankful for my producer, Misty, and her excellent uh, uh, vocational craft on this podcast over many months. I'm so thankful for Salem as well. There's going to be a few changes coming up to this podcast, this very podcast. It's going to hold steady. The name is going to be Grace and Truth. It'll pump right into your feeds as usual, but I'll be talking more about that in coming weeks. Nonetheless, let's dive in. Our fourth truth that we need to talk about with regard to raising boyish boys and feminine girls is this. Men and women are complementary and distinct in all of the scripture. Men and women are complementary but distinct in the rest of scripture. We were talking last week primarily about Genesis 1 through 3, and we went a few other places as well. What I want to do, though, is, is indicate to you that in this fourth truth, we're just we're just simply capturing the fact that there is no daylight between the design of God, as you find it in Genesis 1 through 3, and then the way that godly men and women live in the rest of the Bible. You think about this with regard to manhood for a minute. Men serve as the key leaders in the nation of Israel in normal terms, as prophet, priest, and king. Um, you think of David uh, and how he serves in uh, various roles in the nation of Israel. And then when he comes uh, near to the close of his life, he calls his son Solomon to his deathbed in 1 Kings 2, 1 and 2, and he says this, I'm about to go the way of all the earth. Be strong and show yourself a man and keep the charge of the Lord your God. He goes on to make clear that um, it is essential that Solomon find his strength in God, but that strength is not fundamentally spiritual strength. It's not fundamentally military strength. It's not fundamentally political strength or intellectual strength even. There are various dimensions of a man's life. You know, he's got a body to steward. He's got a mind to cultivate. He's got, you know, work to do, vocation to build. All sorts of realities come into play in those respects. But fundamentally, the strength that a man is to show, show yourself a man and David says, is to be in the spiritual realm first and foremost. And this is what Christians bring. We bring a lot to the discussion of manhood, womanhood alike, but this is our really core contribution. When we're calling men to strength today, uh, we're lined up with a whole bunch of voices out there who are saying the same. But if you're following the conversation in what is called the red pill world, the manosphere, these sorts of terms, you'll know that uh, at least some of the strength that is called for is actual physical strength. The Bible is not against that at all for men. Uh, in fact, I believe from 1 Corinthians 9, 27, another text that physical training is of, of use to men, of, of all Christians, in fact. But the spiritual strength that Solomon is supposed to show is going to be strength that is not grounded in him. It's not that Solomon just needs to be a better you know, follower of God in his own strength. It's that he needs to trust and rely upon and lean on God. He needs to cultivate his prayer life. Uh, he needs to call upon God for his mercies and his graces. He needs to be in the word of God as he is able. He needs to be a faithful follower and worshiper of Yahweh. That, listen, that is where masculine strength is found in the Bible. It ripples into the rest of your life. It's not that you're supposed to be intellectually weak or physically weak as a man, you know, by intention. Um, but fundamentally, if you don't have spiritual strength, you will not show yourself a man. The maturity that David calls Solomon to exercise is all found in God. 
It's all anchored in God. This is how Christians today do not merely have one seat at the table in the manhood conversation. We have to be the foremost voice in the manhood conversation. We overlap with some voices out there who are not Christian, who are calling men to discipline and self-control and do hard things. We have overlap. But what we most contribute to the conversation is what men most need. It is gospel-driven spiritual strength. That's what David summoned Solomon to show, and that is a a biblical call that is echoed, of course, in the New Testament in 1 Corinthians 16, 13, where Paul tells the Corinthian church to act like men. There we see that there is a certain brand of action that is manly. It's marked out as belonging to, befitting a mature adult man, not a boy, not a child, and and not a woman. And so we've got to say, the Bible speaks with one voice to the call on the church to raise boys to be men, to give them an understanding of maturity, an understanding of self-control, of discipline, of toughness, uh, of, of work ethic, and a lot more things we could say, but none of that is just uh, practical. None of that is just a, another habit you need to tack on. All of that is anchored in a young man learning to cultivate his spiritual life. And all of that in turn is centered in communing with the living God through prayer, through reading of the word, through serving the church, through trusting Christ as your Lord and Savior in fundamental terms. Be strong and show yourself a man. So there is a coherent and a stable vision of manhood in the Old Testament that endures in the New Testament era that is still operative today. The same is true for womanhood, for biblical womanhood. Christian women don't most need outside voices, secular authorities to tell them about womanhood. You can glean some realities there. You can pick up, I don't know, a magazine on home design if you want as a Christian woman. And I'm sure you can find uh, uh, practical tips and, and wisdom and good ideas and maybe even some some ideas that you align with. But fundamentally, to, to raise a girl to be a godly woman, you need the scripture. You need biblical wisdom. And it's right there to be harvested for girls and boys, men and women alike. Think about a text like Proverbs 31. Proverbs 31 is not supposed to be a prison cell for Christian women uh, by which they lock themselves in and feel guilty for the rest of their days because they are not the perfect Christian woman. That's not what Proverbs 31 is there for in your Bible. It's there to give you something to aspire to as a godly woman in the Old Testament, Old Covenant period. And you see a lot about the Proverbs 31 woman that you you want to take and emulate uh, today as a Christian woman. The, the Proverbs 31 woman fears the Lord and follows the Lord. Proverbs 31, 30 indicates that she lives for God. That's the core of biblical womanhood. Biblical womanhood isn't about doing certain tasks and calling it Christian or just happening to be Christian. Christian womanhood is centered in God. To live as a biblical woman, to live out biblical womanhood, you have to know the living God. So again, just like biblical manhood, you have to know the Lord Jesus Christ as your savior. You have to repent of all your sin and trust in Jesus and then by the power of the spirit, follow Jesus. It's not going to be a perfect following, but it's a consistent following throughout your life. That is the core of biblical womanhood. So ladies, clear the deck. If you're feeling a lot of anxiety and pressure to adopt certain practices or habits or or vocational callings as a Christian woman and feeling like you're not a Christian woman, if you don't do all of these outward realities, well, some of those may be good. Some of those, those may be something you can develop in and grow in, but the core of biblical womanhood is knowing God. It's knowing God. It's nothing other than that, just like that is the core of biblical manhood. Back to Proverbs 31. She is a, a, a vibrant picture of um, another term that scripture assigns to biblical womanhood. She's a helper. Her husband trusts in her while he sits with the elders at the city gates, uh, Proverbs 31, 11, and 23. By the way, think about that phrase in and of itself. Think about what that shows about what this godly couple, they're not a perfect uh, following God couple, <laughs> just like our marriages aren't perfect marriages. There is no perfect marriage out there. It makes me feel kind of strange when people talk about 
how we've never had a fight. My wife and I have never had a disagreement in all our marriage, you know, 50 years or whatever. And you just go, have you had a real marriage? <laughs> because I'm a sinner and she's a sinner. And, and yes, we are totally redeemed by God in the sense that we are fully a Christian. And yet, man, we all stumble in many ways. But amidst those challenges, amidst the sin that she brings and I bring to my marriage relationship, uh, in Proverbs 31, the husband trusts in his wife while he's gone, while he's providing for his family and working uh, to put food on the table for that family. He's not there throughout the day, at least in, in this chapter of the Old Testament. She is. But while he's gone, he, he's not, you know, trying to figure out what she's doing. He's not distrusting her. He trusts in her. So, so there's a bond that has been forged over time. It's not something that happens when you take one of these little guys and you just put it on a woman's hand and then she puts it on yours. Oh, wow, we have now achieved a perfect state of trust and it will never flicker or waver or go through any difficulty or trial. No, this is the beginning. This is a ring, by the way, in case you're wondering on audio what I'm doing. I'm holding a ring up to the camera. This is the beginning of you and her saying, uh, we're going to forge a real marriage. The marriage has begun. You got to have the beginning of a marriage. That's a beautiful and wonderful thing. That's totally right and appropriate and good. But that's not, that's not when the bond locks into place, never to have to be worked on again. That's when the bond begins. And now there's a whole lot of hard work to follow. And, and, and it's not that by year five or year 10 or 15 or 20 or 25 or 30, the hard work is done. You may be listening to this or watching this right now, and you're thinking, I must be in a different category, you know, of, of Christian marriage, because we still got stuff that, you know, we're working through and we're, we're years and maybe even decades into this. Maybe, maybe you even have grandkids. I don't know. And you're still working through stuff and, and you're still battling sin together. And he has sin patterns or she has sin patterns. And you tick some, you tick each other off some days, you know, these sorts of things. You got to forgive each other. Are we in a different category of Christian marriage where forgiveness actually, actually has to be regularly applied? Aren't there all these other couples who they don't have to forgive each other because they just seem to functionally be perfect and never sin against one another. At least that's the image they present to us. If that is the image being presented to you, I have news for you. That is an image because in real Christian marriage, forgiveness has to be uh, offered, extended, granted, received, and made practical on a day by day, week by week basis. The heart of her husband trusts in her. Brothers and sisters, this couple has worked hard. We can say by implication, They've forged that bond. They've probably, you know, it's an archetypal picture of the Proverbs 31 woman, but they've probably gone through some ups and downs. They've probably gone through some trials, maybe some of them severe. But nonetheless, what God does over the years and what he uses the hard things to do is build trust by his grace. This doesn't happen magically. This happens when a couple lives out the rhythms of Scripture, when you confess sin, forgive one another, talk through what needs to change, embrace that in a posture of humility, both husband and wife, and, and that trust just builds and grows and gets stronger and stronger. So be encouraged um, to hear this, I pray, from Scripture, not from me, uh, and, and know that the core of this is praying and asking God to work and grow your marriage and strengthen it and know that God will do that. He loves to do that. I can't guarantee any one result, of course, for every couple out there. But in general terms, this is what God loves to do. The righteous woman's burden, we move on, is her family and her home. She strengthens her home through economic activity, Proverbs 31, 13, 16, and 24. She cooks for her household, verse 15. She clothes her loved ones. Verse 21, she speaks truth and wisdom uh, to the members of her household. The care and nurture of this woman's family and her home occupy her attention constantly. People say, does your wife work? And in technical terms, in terms of drawing a paycheck, a lot of us men say, no, she doesn't work in terms of drawing a paycheck. The reality is, yes, she works like a banshee. She's always working. And, and that's what you see in Proverbs 31 with this archetypal picture of a godly woman. She's, she's working constantly. Oh, is your wife gifted? Uh, if, if gifting only means getting a salary for application of those gifts, then a homemaker and a, a child racer, I guess, is not gifted. 
Nothing could be further from the truth for so many of us in the church. We have freedom in terms of, you know, when a woman reenters the workforce or, you know, all these kind of questions. Does she contribute to the economic well-being of the home and part-time ways, these sorts of things? There's lots of gray areas here. But, but hear me, when a woman is building a home and especially raising children in the fear and admonition of the world to be disciple of the Lord, excuse me, to be disciples of the Lord Jesus Christ, not, not of the world, but of Christ, she is using her gifts in amazing ways. She, she can't help it. She's going to have to use every gift she's got every day she lives because this is no joke, uh, the work of child raising and homemaking. And that is what you see in the whirling dervish portrait of Proverbs 31. So this is helping us understand what God loves, what God values, God loves biblical womanhood. God loves for women to take those gifts, abilities, skills, and strengths when he has, has blessed them with children, that is, and with a home, that is, with a marriage. Uh, and, and of course, there's varying callings in the church along those lines. But when that's locked into place, God loves that. God is seeing all that anonymous, humble labor, grinding labor day after day as a woman, like a Proverbs 31 woman, raises her kids and builds her home and lives for God's glory. Such a beautiful portrait there. And you see, by the way, beyond this, images of godly women throughout the Old Testament who are serving God, not just in the ways I just described, but who actually are called to some, some different situations. Let me just list a few of several we could name. Hannah desires the gift of children, desires to live in the ways I was just talking about. But as we see in 1 Samuel 1 and 2, for numerous years is barren. She can't have kids. And this is an agonizing struggle because her husband does not fully understand what she is going through. He has another wife, Penina, who is, um, you know, effectively a porcupine of a person and uh, digs Hannah because Penina can have kids and Hannah can't. And so the scripture gives eloquent voice in the person, the real person of Hannah for women out there who really do face down barrenness, who, who very much want to live out what we were just talking about with Proverbs 31 in terms of raising the kids, that is, but can't. And so that's a real condition. That's a real effect of fallenness. And uh, it has it has all sorts of effects for a woman. Uh, Hannah grieves this state, mourns this state, wants to have kids very badly, but can't. But And yet she goes to the Lord and prays in her lowness. And eventually God hears her prayer and gives her uh, Samuel uh, as a son, and Samuel goes on to be one of the most significant leaders of the nation of Israel. So um, we get a picture of persevering Christian, what I guess we call it Christian, persevering Christian womanhood in the person of Hannah. And I always say this when I talk about Old Testament saints on this podcast and in my broader, very humble little ministry, but there is such gold to be harvested from the examples of the Old Testament saints that very few preachers and teachers do harvest. I cannot tell you why, but when you go to these kind of people like a Hannah and you study their lives and you walk through for your people, let's say in an expository sermon, the lessons of the life of Hannah uh, for women, but also for all the church, you're going to harvest a lot there. Why do we not hear more about godly people Godly men and women from the Old Testament, I can't answer that in any good way because it doesn't make any sense to me because there is such encouragement sitting there uh, like a ripe crop to be harvested by the church. All I can do is, is put this humble little word out there and say, I would encourage you if you're a pastor, a preacher and teacher to give your people not just a one off, but a, a sermon series you know, persevering faith in wild days or something like this and go to the Old Testament and preach 10 different men and women to encourage your people. Another godly woman who's so important in the Old Testament narrative is Esther. Esther does not desire uh, from what the scriptural narrative uh, reveals to get way high up in Persian officing, uh, you know, to be a, a queen of the king. But that's exactly what happens to her. She's a Jewish girl who is brought into the king's harem of one of many wives of his. And God gives her favor. God uses her unique beauty, her stunning beauty, apparently. And uh, uh, the king gives her uh, what she asks. And she is used in numerous places. She is used to end up saving the Jews themselves by virtue of her request to her uncle. Um, and so she saves, as Esther 4 shows in the Old Testament, she saves the Jewish people. God uses a woman who is very beautiful, young woman, 
and uh, she's courageous, she's fearless, and God blesses her and all his people uh, through the life of Esther. Just a, a powerful story there. Deborah. Deborah is a judge uh, of Israel. She tries to get the men of Israel to go to war against the wicked uh, foes of Israel. They won't do it. And so um, Deborah leads the, the people alongside Barak. She calls Barak up, even as she tells Barak in Judges 4.9, that he will not receive honor because the Lord is going to sell Sisera into the hand of a woman, which shows us that against some of the stereotypes out there on the part of egalitarians, Deborah is not seeking to, you know, puff herself up and be this warrior priestess. She wants the men of Israel to step up and lead as they are clearly called to do, but they won't. Nonetheless, the picture of godly womanhood that Deborah gives us is a very powerful one. It shows us that she is used of God. She is faithful to God and, and God blesses her for that. So those are just some quick etchings uh, of biblical manhood and biblical womanhood that we find throughout the biblical narrative. Let's move on to our fifth point uh, of six in this two-part series. We need to help our kids understand their body is a gift. We need to help our kids understand their body is a gift. It is a gift specifically of God. And what I'm doing here, by the way, is building the case. I work in systematic theology and, and public theology. And what you do in theology is you build up the wall brick upon brick, by the way. So I'm not just throwing out truths at you. I never try to do this on this podcast and won't in the future, God willing. I'm trying to build. I'm trying to build a wall here. And, and each truth is a brick and they build off of each other. So all the stuff we talked about last week with the foundations of manhood and womanhood in scripture in Genesis 1 through 3 applies here. And we're just now moving into the practical. I'm going to talk more at this point, not so much about specific citations. There'll be a few, but I'm talking now about practical matters. So this is where we take what we have studied thus far. So much more we could be saying, so much more we could be citing, and yet we're going to boldly and fearfully um, uh, apply it. What we need to help boys understand then is that their body is a gift of God. God has given them their body. They are a boy because God made them a boy. They're not incidentally a boy, and they don't simply happen to have the anatomy and, frankly, the genitalia of a boy. No, their body is their identity, and their body, their body constitutes a huge part of their calling from God. If you have the body of a boy, you are a boy. You will become a man. And we want our boys to understand this and to appreciate it. And we want to celebrate boyhood and manhood in our Christian homes and in our Christian churches. We're not talking about, you know, weird drumming ceremonies around a midnight fire where we do strange rituals and celebrate this in a chant. I mean, I guess you can do that if you want. That's not what I'm fundamentally calling for. I'm calling for just very normal instruction and discipleship in the context of the church and the family where we celebrate boys being boys, according to scripture. And we bring in what nature witnesses to us about boyhood. We understand that boys, I think I said this in the previous episode, have on average 2,000 to 3,000% more testosterone than girls. And boys have on average 50 to 60% more upper body strength than girls. And boys on average are better at manipulating objects in space, much better actually in terms of studies. And all that doesn't point to the superiority of men over women. That's not the case we're making here. Uh, I would never use, I see that language out there on social media, men are superior to women or women are inferior to men. What I would say is there are categories where men are better at some things than women. And then there are categories where women are better at some things than men. And uh, so we don't need to make this a zero sum game and we don't need to make this a competition. And, and, and we as men should not be insecure and ultimately end up shading things toward men being better than women. Or on the other side, if you're a feminist, women being better than men, the Bible doesn't give you a case for either. The Bible is not going to enfranchise that case. It doesn't teach us that men are really more necessary than women or women are really more necessary uh, than men. It doesn't teach that. The sexes are complementary in scripture. Remember that it is not good that Adam is alone and that God makes a helper fit for him. And she is not the helper because she is inferior to him of lesser worth than him. She is the helper because she brings skills, abilities, and gifts to the table that the world and the mission of God must have. And, and, and one more application 
the man cannot procreate by himself and so their bodies fit together. Their bodies literally are complementary, even as they themselves, the man and the woman, are complementary. And so that is a, how the human race is going to endure and fill the earth. There's no shame then in a boy being a boy. A boy needs discipleship, though. We're, we're not meaning so cast it all off, cast off all constraints and just turn boys loose outside and, and, and don't, don't really give them any shepherding because you don't want to, you don't want to, you know, rob them of their masculine nature and their masculine gifts. That's not the case we offer boys. We were talking earlier on this episode about how David uh, pushed Solomon toward spiritual strength, a crucial element of which is, is self-control. We know that the book of Proverbs teaches us that the one who rules his own spirit is better than the man who takes a city. This is such a vital word for us today when because genuinely a feminist attacks on men and on the very concept of manhood and certainly strong manhood, men are reacting to that. They're hitting the beep overreaction button and they're like, oh, you you're telling me I should be weak as they really are hearing in different ways. Well, I'm going to be super strong. And what we need to say is we do want men to be strong, but that strength is has to be the strength of self-control, the strength of self-discipline. That's not all it is, because there are times uh, to be physically active, to go to war, to protect, to defend, and so on and so forth. But we want to anchor a boy's strength in self-rule, powered by the Spirit, powered by the gospel. So we're not saying in, in laying out what biblical manhood is, turn boys loose, let them do whatever, let them destroy the home and break every bone in their body by next Wednesday. There's going to, to be some wrestling. There's going to be some competition, some serious competition. Uh, there's going to be some tears at times and, and so on and so forth. And, and we want our boys to, to go outside and play and these sorts of things. But um, we, we have to shape them and train them and raise them and discipline them and disciple them as boys. There's no shame in being a boy and having the body of a boy. We want our boys to understand that. And likewise, there's no shame in being a girl and having the body and calling and gifting and nature of a girl. We want our girls to understand that God has made them just like he has made boys. And here again, we're not communicating in the home that the boys are really important and the girls are of lesser, lesser importance. We're communicating that God made both sexes. He personally made, Yahweh personally made both sexes. And we need our kids to understand that. And we need girls to understand that God is the one who created womanhood. And God is the one who created the feminine body. And if you have a feminine body, if you have a female body with a female anatomy and female genitalia, you are a woman. That is it. It's settled. Um, you don't have a different anatomy than your true identity, your gender identity. In the case of either those who have a boy's body or those who have a girl's body. Your body is not lying to you. Your body is the gift of God. And we want our kids not to be scared of their body or, or do a kind of weird, twisted modesty thing, maybe in particular with girls where they feel ashamed of their body as they grow and develop. We don't want that. We, we don't think as Christians you have to cloak a girl's body or a boy's in, you know, seven layers of clothing. We're not scared of that. We want to raise our, our daughters to embrace, by God's grace, a modest life and a modest uh, self-presentation and appearance. And that's very much a work in progress, of course. <laughs> Lots to say there about how that's done. We want our boys to be modest, by the way, as well. We absolutely do. But we know the unique allure of the feminine body uh, in normal terms. And so we want to train our girls to uh, live modestly, dress modestly, present themselves modestly. But we want to avoid shaming girls for having, as time goes on, a womanly body. There's no shame in that. And there should not be shame communicated along those lines. I am not teaching my daughters that they are walking grenades, you know, out there uh, that, you know, just by virtue of looking like a girl, like a woman, as time goes on, you know, they're going to, they're going to just explode in public detonating and, and young men are going to be slain everywhere because of their physicality. That's not a healthy understanding of womanhood or girlhood. Um, we want to raise daughters to understand um, the real pull of sexual lust and, and how to handle that. And, 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 that takes real care as in those teenage years and beyond. Um, but we're not training our girls to fear being a woman fundamentally.
We want girls to understand furthermore, you know, the beauty of childbearing if they are called into marriage, the beauty of womanly nurture. We want them to understand why they have that, at least a lot of times, that emotional intuitiveness that men don't seem to have, at least some of the time. We want them to understand why they want to nurture things, why they want to work with kids, why they are specially attuned to all sorts of realities around them where men can tend to be more single track and focused on a certain task, these things can get into sin and they can get overblown and overdone and, and, and all of that, but they don't have to be. And so we need to help our kids understand the gift of their body. Six and finally, for this two-part episode, we need to point our kids to the goodness of distinctiveness. We need to point our kids to the goodness of distinctiveness. And here, as I was just talking about at long last, <laughs> is some more practical realities. And let me just dive right in. We want to raise our girls toward womanhood. We want to raise our boys toward manhood. That is going to necessitate that we make practical decisions. That is going to mean that we have to handle gray areas. In every category, we are not going to find that the Bible has zapped into an encyclopedia and now every practical question we could ever face is immediately answered in a line of scripture. There's a lot that scripture lays out for, for boyhood and girlhood, manhood and womanhood. I've tried to capture some of that, no doubt inadequately, in these two episodes. But I want to put a word in here. We want to be very careful about making our applications equivalent to the word of God. Don't do that. However, we have to make applications. We have to give practical guidance. We have to give wisdom on all sorts of matters. And when it comes to raising boyish boys, that means that you're making decisions in gray areas, facing hard questions, but you have to make those decisions. And you have to do that with raising girls just the same. So if you understand that scripture teaches the goodness, even the beauty of distinctiveness of the sexes, that it is not a problem for men to be men and women to be women and those two things to not be the same. A ton of overlap, both image bearers before God and yet distinct sexes that God himself made. That means that when you're raising boys and you're, tr you're wanting them, for example, to be a protector and a provider, you've got to then think through, yes, how you teach the biblical ideal, but also what practical real life decisions you make toward that end. So let me just give a quick word there. For example, if you want your boy, if God calls him, you can't know this, but if God calls him to be the provider of a family, well, what does that entail? That entails that he's got to be a worker. What does that entail? That entails he has to be trained to work. And probably you don't want him to work at the simplest task before him. Probably you want him, I think you can say, based on a reasonable assessment of what is wise, to get experience in different fields, to, to do some work, I don't know, digitally uh, in this 21st century age, but also some work outside. You want him to do some jobs that he likes, hopefully, but you also want him to do some jobs that he's not naturally inclined toward. You want him to get, if I can speak a little impolitely, you want him to get a little dirty here. You want him to do some hard things. And this is something that's dropping out of American life in general uh, in our nice, neat, manicured you know, contexts. That's not uh, a sign to us that we should blow everything up and never live in suburbia and only live in the woods or something like this and pretend like it's the 15th century. We don't have to pretend like it's the 15th century. But what we do need to do as intentional fathers and mothers, as a husband and wife couple, is get our heads together, get wisdom from older couples, Christians, and figure out how to raise a boy to be a worker. Again, that takes practical wisdom. Every couple isn't going to do this the same way. Every church isn't going to do this the same, same way. Some churches are in agricultural context still today. Many of them are where you really can send boys out into fields of wheat and, uh, you know, for the summer months or whatever, they can do that. They can harvest all day long. I grew up in Maine. So I grew up 
raking blueberries. People laugh at that when I say that. It's very hard work. It was really good for me. I'm so thankful that my father in particular pushed me to do that work and my mother did as well. I'm so thankful for a a godly father and mother who trained me to do hard work, including hard work that I would not have chosen on my own that that in turn shaped a work ethic. So you've got to do that for boys. And you've got to do for girls, um, you, you've got to point them toward nurture and you've got to point them toward child raising. They may not end up married with kids, but what you want to do is understand that it is good for them to cultivate nurture. So you want to make decisions for your girls that help them understand that being a wife and a mother is a beautiful thing, that nurturing life is a beautiful thing, that God has uniquely made women uh, to be able to do these kind of things. And so you want to put them in context where they can uh, flex those realities and develop those capacities. If you know that, you know, you're aiming your daughters to at least understand the goodness of um, homemaking, let's say, well, you shouldn't expect that they're going to turn 23 and press a button and know how to cook and, and know how to bake or something like this. You may not send them into marriage if they get married or single womanhood with, you know, 700 recipes that you yourself have crafted at midnight for, for every year for five years, but you at least want to give them a sense of how to do that, I think, by implication. Again, these are gray areas. How do you do this? How much does a mother cook with her daughters or how much does she train them to do uh, cleaning of a house or shopping or, you know, home design, home decor, all, all such related matters? There's a lot of gray area there. Uh, there's a lot of wisdom needed. Every Christian family is not going to do it the same. But nonetheless, there is a shared burden, I would argue, when we're, when we're going to Scripture and figuring out God's priorities for men and women. Um, there, there's a lot then that we take and we say, we may not do this exactly the same as, uh, you know, church member over there and, and, and that family is doing it, but we're going to do this. We're not going to leave our kids without any guidance. And so when you're doing this, water break, you're not, you're not doing this, um, training them to think that you are handing them the one way this could ever be lived out, at least in different ways. Uh, you, you are trying to give them a script, a roadmap. You're not trying to bind them into the one perfect, uh, form of manhood with regard to, Provision. You're trying to raise them to understand the biblical priority for men of providing for a family, providing for themselves first, and then give them some skills and abilities toward that end. Let, let me make one more quick application. Sports gets way out, way out of blown, way out of proportion, excuse me, for boys and girls alike, but in some contexts, especially for boys. So let's not put too much in sports. Let's not idolize sports as a start. That would be sinful. However, many of us have concluded that sports in the modern American form can at least contribute to our boys' formation, can teach them work ethic and and teamwork and uh, persevering through hard odds and overcoming trials and everything not going right for you, but nonetheless showing up day after day. Okay, well, if that's the case, then a father does well to go outside and – play catch with his son or go to a gym and play catch with his son and help his his son develop some rudimentary skills. He doesn't have to train his son, you know, by next Tuesday uh, to be to be the second coming of the great Olympians before us. But he does want to give his son uh, some tools. And I, I, I think I'm talking about something rather inconsequential with regard to sports. But I think that principle applies broadly, well beyond uh, the physicality of boyhood to how we want to train our kids. And all of this means in turn that we can't let our kids be parented by screens and their phones and tablets and babysitters and outside voices and on it goes. We have to do the hard work to father and mother. We have to ourselves get off of our devices and plug in with our kids and talk to them and communicate. That's something you have to train them to do, by the way, as well. You have to train your kids even to communicate. And that sounds basic, but I think some of you are going to resonate with this out there. A lot of kids today have no idea how to communicate. Forget playing a violin like Stradivarius himself by age 16. A lot of kids out there can't answer basic questions 
when a kind stranger comes up to them at church and says, hey, how are you? They, they, have, they don't answer you. Brothers and sisters, our society has lost a substantial measure of what it means to be a father and mother, husband and wife. But we're talking primarily here about fathers and mothers. Our society has had a lot of that just cut out. And that has affected the church. And there are a lot of husbands and wives out there who, and I'm not scorching people to ash, but they're not even really in the game with regard to training kids, discipling kids, communicating with kids, building kids' skill set up, engaging their kids. You may never get 29 levels deep in some esoteric subject with your child. If all you do, though, is raise in the Christian faith as best you can uh, a boy or girl who can communicate basically and work at a basic level and um, think at a basic level and on it goes and function around other people, that in itself <clears throat> is a big victory. And we need a lot more of this. But what this is going to take is investment and attention. We've got to give our kids attention and we've got to invest in them. And we want to raise them in distinctly masculine ways when they're a boy and distinctly feminine ways when they're a girl. This isn't going to mean for every boy to anticipate the question that I'm going to get and should get. He's got to be a hunter and a fisher and love, you know, in his free time, uh, tracking frogs by the local creek. I would say it's often good when boys get some of that exposure, but that's not what biblical manhood is going to reduce to, killing a deer. I think that can be manly as a pursuit. Um, but some boys are going to love hunting and some boys aren't. So what we don't want to do as a father, for example, or a mother, is teach our boy that if he doesn't love fishing uh, when he's got a free Saturday, he's not really a man. We want to anchor biblical manhood in the word and the gospel, okay? What God expects of us, I believe, is that we will fill in the practical areas as a father for our boys in particular, according to us. So we're not training our boy to be a homemaker, right? And we're not then training him to, to do the girly stuff first and foremost, so to speak. We're training him in, in masculine pursuits. We're showing him what leadership, protection, and provision looks like in a family. And we're trying to do things that definitely do tap into his physical capacities as a man. But there's going to be ebb and, ebb and flow there. Uh, there's going to be boys who are really good at coding on a computer. That's not necessarily unmasculine. But what a father is responsible for doing alongside the biblical instruction is he's responsible for helping his son understand that it is good to be a boy. So he's making decisions and choices with regard to boyhood that fit with the biblical scheme, that don't go against it intentionally, as if he's trying to educate his boy to be a woman. All the same is true with a girl. There's gray area here. Yes, there are some girls who love, air quotes, girly things. And we want girls to understand the goodness of feminine pursuits. We're not giving that up. I'll take heat for saying these kind of things. I don't care. We cannot give these things up. But we also have to know there are going to be girls who love soccer, even as they love playing with dolls. And we don't have to freak out at that or fear that our daughter who likes that soccer game ha has now, you know, jumped into some uh, deficient form of womanhood. There are gray areas. There are hard questions. We can answer them with wisdom, much prayer, seeking out counsel from older men and women in the Christian faith. And we can trust that God will work by his grace. After all, we are not the one who makes anyone a Christian man or a Christian woman. That is the work of God. That is all his department. And so our responsibility is to train disciples as best we can um, in our culture, in our given setting, in a way that honors the design of manhood that I've tried to sketch out in these two episodes and the design of womanhood that I've tried to sketch out as well. 
And in doing so, then we're not scared of saying something is manly or something is womanly, something is masculine or something is feminine. There are gray areas and there's a, a middle of overlap, but there are also masculine and feminine pursuits and activities. And we want our kids to get a sense of that, to get a strong sense of that. And then their personality will develop, their vocation will reveal itself in God's good time. I need to conclude. The concluding word I have for you is uh, consonant with what I just said, to remind you that, yes, there's a lot of training that is needed. Yes, there's a lot of uh, intentional discipleship that has to occur. God did not create a university fundamentally uh, for kids to be reared in. He created a family. He created a family which has a definite structure, a father and a mother united in covenantal marriage for life. That's his design. And then kids come naturally from that, at least in ordinary terms. And that's what God wants. And that's where kids are supposed to be reared. So there's those biblical truths that get passed down and taught in the home, always anchored in the gospel of grace. And then there's these practical areas that require wisdom and, and, and where we do answer questions uh, in our own way. And that is good too. And I just want to put wind in your sails as I conclude as a Christian father or mother to do this work, do this work. You're not going to do it perfectly, but that's okay. Do it faithfully in much prayer. And that is truly the last word I have for you. Pray, pray for your children, pray for your child, pray for them to love God's design for manhood and God's design for womanhood. That's not split off from Christian faith. That's how we are to live out Christian faith as a Christian man or a Christian woman. But this is not on your back. Ultimately, God is behind all of this. God is the only one who can save your kids. God is the only one who can give them a love for Christian manhood and Christian womanhood. And by his grace, he will. He will work as he sees fit for his glory. God bless you.